Well, hello, and thanks for being here today. You know, I know whether we've got folks in the audience right now or whether things are streaming, you know, the whole purpose of this talk, is, of these talks, is for the future. And we have the electronic means to share things, and so I'm, I'm really excited to, to be here today. I'd like to share with you what it was like to live in space. I just returned in May from a six-month uh, expedition to the ISS. And for me, it was magic. And I tell people, you know, if I could, and actually this is a quote from Don Pettit, another one of us, our ISS astronauts, if I could pack up my entire family and bring them up to the space station, I would. It's an amazing place, and the only reason to come home was maybe to pay the bills, but certainly to, to see my family. I would have stayed another six months in, in a minute. Uh, and I'd like to just share what it was like to live up there, you know, a little bit from our perspective, uh, from, you know, Ted women or from women, that it's, it's a, I think these things that we do are hard, you know, going, living on the space station, looking further to the moon, to Mars. And they, they take everybody on our team, and I'm hoping that's what you will get from this talk, is that we all bring special gifts. Some of them are a little more stereotypically female, some are a little more stereotypically male, but it's gonna take all of us to do these things that are very hard. So, the International Space Station. I, uh, my son says, yeah, this is mom's space house. <laughs> And this is one of my favorite pictures here. And I don't know if we can make the lights in the auditorium be a little darker. Um, that would be great. But what I love about this picture is if this is us looking out our window on the space station. And you can see the space station itself right here. And then there's the glow of the atmosphere and the Earth. And, and this is like looking out your back porch. This was my back porch for six months. I was part of Expedition 26. There's six of us. And also Expedition 27. So this is the International Space Station, my home, getting ready for launch. This is a place that was uh, pretty tight to both practice and to fly in. There's a lot of things that we do to get ready, and you're just seeing a, just a really quick snapshot of some of the things. But now it's launch night, and it's the night that I had worked really my whole life to be ready for. And no one is just chosen for a job like this. I'm waving to my family, waving goodbye. And there's my son and my husband. They got to come to Baikonur. From, I launched on the Soyuz and came home on the Soyuz. They got to come out there to Baikonur, Russia, in Kazakhstan, and see me launch. I'm urging my crewmates to take small steps and slow, which they're ignoring. <laughs> and I'm, I'm in a place that I always dreamed of being, which is inside a rocket on my way to live in space. I'd had two shuttle missions, and I loved them. I loved living up there. I loved doing experiments up there. As a scientist, there's things that we can do that we just can't do down here on Earth. We can do them in a microgravity environment, and Julie Robinson is going to tell you some more about those. And as a scientist, just the fact that we can do those kinds of things up there and not down here is a reason to be going. So here we are in our little bitty Soyuz. It's a very small place. And then we dock with the space station right before Christmas. And this shot right here is the one I want you to pay attention to. This is what it's like to live up there. It's not about floating. It's about flying. And anybody that knew me grow growing up knows that I was not the most graceful person, despite it being my middle name, and even the most coordinated. And up there in that environment, it is a, it's like living on a different planet, and I felt like a colonist. We had a supply ship, a Japanese supply ship that came up to visit. We're actually making this origami because we were up there during the time that the tsunami happened in Japan. And those white cranes represent rebuilding and hope for the Japanese people. Here's another supply ship docking automatically. We're trained for this in case things don't work out in terms of automatic modes. There's a lot of things that we practice, and that's something I really try to emphasize to the younger audiences, is, is that you don't just land in a job like this. You get ready, and that their job is to be getting ready for the future. We were known as a, a mission that had a record number of supply ships, Japan, ESA, and Russia. And also, the space shuttle came up twice, bringing a new piece of the space station. So we're taking video of the space shuttle. And this is this new module for the space station. And it's a place that we're going to be able to store a lot of the supplies and experiments that we've got up there. The space station will be working well through 2020. That's the official date. But I think it'll be up there for a long time. But you need, actually, a lot of supplies both for people and for experiments, and that module provided that flexibility for us. 
And it's also, I think, you know, living up there, I was with uh, five guys. We, we recently were talking about perhaps um, having to take people off the space station for a period of time, and that was called demanding the space station. And people asked me how I felt about it, and I said, well, I lived up there with five guys, sometimes 11 when the shuttle was present, or 10, and there were days that I dreamed of demanding the space station. <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> it's a magical place to, to live and work. We're bringing really, I think, quite fascinating experiments up there. Or some that you would think, well, if a robot works down here, why do we have to bring it to space? Well, there's things that are going to be different about the way just mechanistically that robot, that apparatus, that environmental recycling apparatus works. And you need to be able to understand what those differences are before you start sending people a long, long way from home, not just uh, up, to, up to the space station, but actually out into space, to, to the moon, to Mars, when they're further away. And we'll talk a little bit about living in space. Uh, I like to show our, our uh, table here is at a diagonal, because we don't have to have it horizontal and in, in, in the way. It just turns out nothing's going to fall off our, our table, unless it's, uh, it's going to have to be Velcroed there anyway. And here's our, one of the experiments that I, I loved, a fluid physics experiment. Every day was made up of just plain old living in space, but more importantly, a number of really, really exciting ex science experiments. Now, this short two-minute uh, video is going to show you some places on the station you've already seen, but I want you to just get the feel for what it's like if this, as if this was your house, as if you woke up in the morning and you came into Node 3 and you passed the treadmill, and now just to the right is the bathroom, just, just a now to the right is the weightlifting machine, and now we're looking into the cupola. We're falling into the cupola, for, although for us, for some reason, it feels like we're going up. And now back through node three, so that's where I would wake up in the morning in my cabin, fly through the lab, you know, do the normal kinds of toilet things. A lot of times people have questions about, you know, gee, as a crew of six, you must have to give up, you know, some of your privacy and, and things like that. And it turns out just not to be true. Look at this place. I mean, this place is amazingly huge. And it's a place where um, the, the possibilities, I think, are endless in terms of doing science. But you're, every day, I, I will actually share with you that I think every day up there was reasonably stressful and um, not, not really harried, but I felt like I was in such an amazing place, and it was my responsibility to really do my best and do my best to accomplish the timeline that the folks um, down here on Earth had, uh, had worked out. And in terms of what experiments needed done, what part of the space station needed replaced or updated or you know, some kind of uh, maintenance. And so feeling that responsibility and things never quite go the way that you would like them to, there's, there's always more to do than you can physically um, possibly do. And I think all of us felt as if the days were never, never long enough. So back to what it takes for a group to live up there on the space station. I, I learned some of my lessons in Antarctica, and I'm going to go through these pretty quickly now, but I learned some of my lessons in Antarctica. This was my camp in the middle of that ice sheet. And I learned a lot of things about how to live with a few people. When we go as these teams to space, we don't get to pick our teams. And we have to learn to look at what people bring to the table and really enjoy and celebrate what they bring to the table and not worry about what they don't bring to the table. This was my underwater experience living in a habitat off the coast of Florida. So other ways of getting ready to be in space. And these are some of the women that have lived in, in space. This is Peggy Whitson, presently the chief of our astronaut office, and Pam Melroy, the second woman uh, commander of the space shuttle. And they're the two commanders, commander of the space station, commander of the space shuttle, meeting in space. And I myself have enjoyed being part of an organization where literally because of the isolation and the risk involved in what we do, we have to depend on each other and we have to get from each other as a team what we don't do well, what we do um, do well. There's Dottie from uh, this morning. It's always hard to up recognize the upside down people. There's Dottie. Uh, Nicole Stott and I are the proud uh, folks who've uh, captured the Japanese supply ship, the only two people to capture free flyer supply ships um, up there. And then just some quick shots of what it's like to, to live up there in space as a crew. And working with tools. You know, I didn't do that as a girl. It wasn't something that I grew up knowing how to do. And so 
Um, I also I actually didn't think maybe I was that good at it, but during the space station training, it was part of what I really had to understand how to do, and it turns out that fixing things it's actually not that hard, and all of us can fix things. And I'm pretty proud of having made that transition and understood that if I just, if I read the directions, if I learn, you know, if I call people on the phone and ask them, you know, for the things that I don't know, that I too can fix things on the space station. Well, I know that Dottie showed a little living in space, but I wanted just to share, uh, this is what sometimes you feel like when you think about the food up in space. And I tell people it all looks terrible, but it, it tastes actually quite good. And uh, the nice thing about living up there is that we, we do have to exercise to maintain our bone and muscle strength about two hours a day. And the good news about that is that you can eat everything that you want every day, all day. <laughs> a little harder when you come home, but just some tasks. And then just plain old living in space. Well, I'm an amateur flute player, and you know I'm not the greatest flute player in the whole world, but I do like to play. And I felt like I was in a special place there to be able to share you know, what living up there was like, and that if I'm somebody who would bring my flute on a trip with me, I should bring it on the trip of my life. So I did, and, and actually what you're going to see is a duet that you can actually find on YouTube with a man named Ian Anderson, who is the flute player from Jethro Tull. And we get to bring a few special things with us in our very small amount of space that we get to bring, and so I brought some flutes with me, just because it was something that was very important to me. And what we did is actually I played up in space and he was playing a concert in Russia on the 12th of April, which is the 50th anniversary of human spaceflight. And so when Ian was playing there, I was playing in space. And when you combine the two, you get a duet between Earth and space. So we'll go on to the next one here. So just a few uh, views, again, of the, just the magic of living up there. But you know, as we, as we look through them, this was our, our window of the cupola. There's Scott Kelly taking pictures, which he did quite a lot. And this is then uh, what the Earth looks like at night as we are, are looking at these pictures. You know, realize that every day there was six of us up there. And you know, I, I actually ended up, you know, with people that I didn't think I would like. I really enjoyed the time. Other people, you know, maybe something small, I thought, well, that'll be okay. And it turned out to be bigger. But when you're the six people that are up there, your job is just to deal with that. And yet the view out the window is really a very, uh, very helpful and makes you, I think, feel very special. You know, I'll give you an example from our mission. I was with um, Paolo Nespoli from Italy. And there's the Grand Canyon. And Paolo is a master at getting things done, okay? He just goes in and he is going to move things from place to place and that job is going to get done. Now, I'm somebody who might think, well, we could do it this way, we could do it this way, there's lots of possibilities. And I would have a hard time really just starting and getting in and picking away and doing it. Whereas Paolo might pick away, but he might not have actually thought of all the ramifications of what we need to do. And together, we were actually a great team and really accomplished quite a deal, quite, quite a lot during our expedition because we learned to, you know, really accept those things in each other. He would come over to me and say, when are we going to start? And, I, and, and, you know, there's times that he would say to me, what am I forgetting? Or I'm going to do this. I think that's the right thing. Is there anything else I should be thinking about? Because he knew that maybe I was thinking about those things. And so as a group, uh, we really... I think accomplished a great deal. And some of those traits, these are just some examples of crops growing around the world, glaciers. Some of those traits are stereotypically, stereotypically for women, and some are, I think, stereotypically male. And I think that the message I, I'd like you to take home is that we need to celebrate all of them. And we shouldn't think, you know, she's not a typical girl, or she is a typical girl. You know, there's just a lot of ways to look at people, and I think you have to just realize that um, we all bring good things and bad things. I just wanted at the end here to close with a, a few views from space. This was for our New York friends, and there's the whole East Coast there. You can see uh, Long Island, New York City, and my favorite, Boston. And there's New York at night, a really big close-up of New York, even closer. So we've got really quite a vantage point up there. And when I see this picture, I think about home, because I am from Massachusetts. 
Not, and not necessarily this home, although I do, get, I do get actually homesick for the space station now. But here's my Massachusetts home. A husband that I left behind, not only for the six months of the mission, but for the, uh, uh, you know, for the two or three years of training ahead of time. He's a glass artist up in Massachusetts. And I think, you know, a topic that you'll see again and again today, families, how do we integrate all those things? And I will tell you, I don't know. I mean, there's times up there I felt like I was doing the right thing, and there was times up there where I really, you know, I really just, you know, didn't know how to deal with the fact that my little guy, who was all boy, was down there, you know, without his mom, who would never have let him take the cat outside <laughs> in the snow. And, and you know, these, you know this, these folks have to, have to miss you, and they, they have their own coping me uh, mechanisms. And I'm glad that we have our cat, which is actually convinced that he's the family dog that uh, keeps him company. And, and I know that's not the same as, uh, as having your mom. Um, but, you know, it's actually the reality that he and I have both known. We have a certain relationship as mother and son. And the thing that I try to take away from that, and I'd like as I end here, for you to think about is that these kids, they are the future. You know, what you see in this face, this is the joy and the curiosity and the eagerness to live life without being, without even thinking about what other people might think. And we need to feed these people. And as the women of the present and the women of the future, we have our work cut out for us. And I think we're off to a good start here at TED today. So thank you very much for, for coming. <laughs>